Let's join Apostle Rick Steele as he ministers a series of teachings called The Names of God. In this message, he teaches us about El Roi. -E. Praise God. So excited to be here to share the word of the Lord with you all. We serve an awesome God, y'all. Amen. You just don't know how good God is. If I were to tell you some testimonies that, that have been percolating, you wouldn't be able to stand yourself right now. Amen, but God is good. What if, uh, what if I were to tell you, now I, I'm, gonna, I'm not speaking contrary to all that's been said, but just hear me. I know that the declarations have gone forth that the door is open, but what you've experienced so far has been the cracking of the door and the light shining through the door. Yeah. It's not fully released yet because it will be released at the conference. That's what the Lord told me. Amen. So I'm not con being contrary. I'm just letting you know. Lord has something for you. Amen. For you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And if you will receive it, receive it by faith. Amen. I I'm, I'm here to tell you your life won't be the same. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise Amen. God. Well, as we get ready to get into this word, let's just pray. Father, this day, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. And we give you honor. We magnify you and we declare unto you alone is the glory. Now, Father, we thank you, Lord. Open up my mouth that it might speak the oracles and the word of the living God. Let truth be their portion. Let it rain down upon their spirit. Let it go deeper into their soul. Let it produce root. Let it produce fruit for your kingdom and for your glory. Holy, Holy Spirit, have your way this day. Go up and down these aisles and touch everybody underneath the sound of my voice. Let them be blessed, let them grow, let them be multiplied according to your word and according to your will. This day, in Jesus' name, and everybody in agree with they said, Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Well, we have been talking about the names of the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, it's really been uh, pretty interesting. We have, we start off in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. Yes. And that's the end of the sermon. Mic drop, period. Have a nice day. Amen. Amen. And that is, that God mentioned by name is Yahweh, just so that we have an understanding. Yahweh. And when we really uh, study it out, it turns out that in the Hebrew, it is something called the Tetragrammatron, which is, they spell it with only the consonants and not the uh, vowels. And so you have Y-H-W-H. -H. Amen. And what we need to understand is it's like breathing the breath of God. When you say it correctly, you, your jaw literally does not move. And your lips do not move. So it's like, yeah. That's awesome. And the next time you need to just spend some time in his presence. Try saying his name like that and just spend time listening and watch him begin to settle peace in your spirit. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And then the Spirit of the Lord had us to move on from there to begin to talk about and we skipped the sequence a little bit. The Lord is having me to go through uh, the Bible in sequential order. Can you take the ring off just a little bit? In sequential order. And we went to Exodus chapter 3 where we talked about I am. Amen. And many people have taken that to be I am whatever you have need of. But the Lord had me to share with you a different attribute. You cannot understand all that he is. Amen. So therefore he could not give you a description. He could not give it to Moses at the time because nothing could contain all of him. No verbal description would contain all of him. It's like if, if, in order to get to know someone, you have to spend time with them. You can't just roll up on somebody and they say a name and you know them. That's not the same thing. Amen. But through us going through these names, going through these attributes, going through these scenarios, we get to understand a little bit of the attributes of God so that we can start to know him better. Amen? And so I am is not simply a declaration of I exist. It's not simply a declaration of he is what you need. 
but it is a statement that you cannot contain everything about me in your little brain. And you're going to have to yield to get to know me so that I can introduce to you who I really am. And to watch this, and it happens through your circumstances. Everything that you have gone through in life, God knows how to work it for your good. For I know that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Only through only a scripture that says something like that. Amen. 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 But guess what? God knows how to work it all. So even when you've been abused, misused, and reused, God knows how to work it out for your good. Be encouraged, somebody. Amen. And then we discovered the next name of God, which is over there in Genesis chapter 14, where... Abram went ahead and had to deliver his cousin Lot because he got taken up by uh, the five different armies and which turned out to be tribes of the Assyrians and uh, just a whole story, a whole hot mess. And we discovered that, that Abram took 318 of his trained servants and he just went and rescued his uh, cousin, which meant that they were already trained. See, when you go to battle, that's not the time to try to get your training together. You better have it together before you go, which is why we take the time to train now because you don't know where the Lord is going to send you. If the Lord is going to send you, that's not the time to try to get it together. But we learned that his name was El El Yon, the possessor of heaven and earth. He owns it all, the cattle on a thousand hills. There is nothing that he has not created for his pleasure. There is nothing that he has not, uh, that is outside of his purview or outside of his domain. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. And when Abraham met with Melchizedek, the priest with no beginning and no end, we began to see that he gave him tithes of all. Now, why did he do that? Because he was acknowledging the possessor of heaven and earth. See, when you give your tithe, watch this. When you give your tithes and your offering, you are acknowledging the possessor that owns everything. Amen. Wow. When you give him honor, as Pastor Joe mentioned, he gives you honor. Amen. It's called exchange, the law of exchange. You give him honor, in exchange he honors you. It's real simple. Bless the Lord. Well, today we're going to go on a little bit further. And with the next name, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 16. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to read this. This is the story of Hagar and Ishmael. And I'm going to read this chapter. Don't worry, it's a short chapter. It's only about 16 verses. So uh, you can handle it. Amen. And then we're going to go back and there's some things to unpack here. Amen. Glory to God. Here we go. Now Sarai... Abram's wife. Now, I just want to pause there for a moment. I want you to notice the name. Her name is Sarai. His name is Abram. Not Abraham. Not Sarah. Sarai and Abram. In other words, his name was changed from Abram to Abraham when he became father of many nations. Sarai, his name was changed to Sarah when her husband became the father of many nations. So this is a snapshot of who they were before they became who God called them to be. So we need to recognize who we're dealing with in the time frame what we're dealing with. So let's just go ahead and read. Abram's wife bore him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, somebody say an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my maid, and it may be that I obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And when he went in unto Hagar, she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived her mistress was despised in her eyes. 
And Sarai said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon you. I have given my maid unto your bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord's judge between me and thee. But Abraham said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in your hand. Do, it, do to her as it pleases you. And when Sarai dealt hardly, that's harshly, with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of the water in the wilderness, and by the fountain on the way to Shur. And she said, Hagar, Sarai's maid. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid. Whence do you come, and to where will you go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to your mistress, submit yourself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply your seed exceedingly, that it will not be numbered for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. And he shall be a wild man, every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. And he shall, she shall call Excuse me. And she called the name of the Lord that spoke to her and said, You, God, see me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that sees me? Wherefore the well was called Ber Laha Roi. And behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram's son. Abram called his son name, which Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Amen, amen. Well, there's some things that we need to unpack here because when we read this story, a lot of these stories are very... You could read them like a novel because they're people's lives. And we just see the high-level things that are going on, but we're going to go a little bit deeper because there's some really interesting things that, that as we get to the name of the Lord that we need to, to get a, a revelation on. Quite point blank, the name of God here that we're dealing with, the attribute that we're facing is the God who sees. El Rohi is the God who sees. Look at your neighbor and say, God sees you. Whatever you're going through, he sees you. Amen. Here we go. Now, as I said at the beginning, the name, pay attention to the name, Sarai and Abraham's wife, is a statement of where they were. It's a snapshot of where they were in life. Her name was Hagar. Now, let's unpack her name a little bit. Her name means rejected and abandoned. Flight or forsaken. My question is, what is wrong with her parents? Who names a child that? It almost makes you wonder if the, if the story was concocted, but it's not. But that just goes to make a statement of how ignorant people can be when they call things and label them. Because don't you know that when you give a name, you are giving an identity, you are assigning a destiny, and you are assigning attributes. All of these things are packed in a name. And so when you assign a name, you need to be very mindful of that which you're calling somebody. Even parents, when they're calling your children, you need to make sure that you always call them the right things on an everyday basis. Because every time you call them, you are assigning an identity, a destiny, and a purpose, and attributes. Amen? So if you call them stupid, guess what? Here we go. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. She blamed it on the Lord. I pray, go unto your, to my maid, and it may be that I obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Now, I, I have to, to pause here for a moment, because to understand the culture of that time, that it is not like today's culture where many women, if they do not have children, 
they decide to go into a career or it's not a big deal or whatever they decide to do. The culture at that time was that your value as a female was associated with your childbearing ability. And so if you could not bear children, it was like somehow you were not a woman. And man, different culture, different thing. Not judging, I'm just saying that's the way it was. Now, in so much that it shows you a little bit of the culture. Now, we're going to identify who Abraham or who Abram and Sarai was before they became the people of faith. This is important to understand because don't you know, every one of us had a, a past before we got saved. Amen. Every one of us had to grow and come to a place where we operate in faith. Don't sit up here and look at us and think, oh, we've always been this way. I'm, we're not all that in a bag of chips, but we're definitely farther down the road than we were before. Amen. Amen. Now, here's what I find fascinating. We're all adults in this room, so I'm just going to talk about it. We are adults, right? Amen. Relatively clear. Amen. So here's my question. And this is what, why I find reading the Bible and these stories fascinating, because the Old Testament talks about the people and their life and their personalities and the characters and all the story. The New Testament talks about Jesus and the new ministries that he established, the apostle, etc., etc., but it does not get into their personality and their character that much, where the Old Testament does. And you get to understand that these were people's lives that they lived, and they were, in many ways, like us, right? Different culture, perhaps, but the concept was the same. And so you get to understand the dynamics of the culture, the interactions, relationships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here's what I find fascinating. Sarai who could not have children, was upset. She says to her husband, I want to give you my maid so that you can go in and have relations and produce a child. I'm just going to be honest with you. Look at Abram's answer. She says, I want you to go have relations with my maid. Did Abram resist? No, he did not. No. Did Abram complain? No, he didn't. Did Abram stand in faith and say, perhaps we need to pray this one through? No. I almost get the impression he kind of volunteered. Yes. <laughs> Which brings us to a real interesting question. When it comes to temptation that is presented, I'm not just talking about relations. I'm talking about any kind of temptation that is presented under any circumstances. Can you be influenced to fall toward that temptation. Oh, wait a minute now. See, it's easy to think about it in the sexual terms, but if we're talking about something that maybe someone wants you to help them steal something on your job, or maybe influence you to say the wrong things, or to come to their side on something that would cause offense to be spread. They're offended, so let me talk you into being offended with me. The temptation is no joke. Amen. It's easy to see right here. You know, he was easy to acquiesce toward that. And so I'm just saying I find it very, very interesting. So what we see here is we see Sarai influencing Abram to step outside of his relationship in order to procreate because she felt substandard instead of believing God. That's kind of messed up. Now, I understand there's such a thing as adoption, surrogacy. That's not what I'm talking about. In those days, they didn't have a needle. So somebody had to make it happen. Amen. 
And since... <clears throat> Help me, Lord. Since he was not a man of faith at this point, who said it worked the first time? It's getting mighty quiet in here. Pray for me, brother. I'm just telling you, this ain't right. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Because when she did conceive and become pregnant, Sarai became jealous of her. But let's see what she says. Down here in verse 5, she says, My wrong be upon me. In other words, I have given my maid to your bosom when she saw that she conceived. I was despised in her eyes. So wait, wait, what? Okay. Just said that when Hagar conceived, she said, hey, God despised her. So not only did the wife lie or to entice him to have relations, but when he did complete the act and pregnant. She lied on her because she was jealous of her. Look at the seeds, no pun intended, that were planted as a result of this misunderstanding of this Failure in behavior. Are you all out there? And Abram says, because she started to treat her cruelly, says, go do, treat her however you want. Do what you want to do with her. And I find that to be a very callous and hard attitude. I mean, it, it's shockingly when you think about it. So, in other words, they used Hagar mistreated her, the wife disrespected her after she gave her body to have their child. And then all of a sudden you want to just be mean and cruel. How many times have people done something nice to you and you've been mean to them? Oh, you're all looking at me like that doesn't happen. Okay, well, this is what the Lord just put in my spirit. He's been nice to you. But yeah, you don't give tithes, you don't give offerings. He just gave that to me right now. They were very cruel. They were very callous to her. They mistreated her. They abused her, misused her. And the reason why I brought up the whole concept of it probably did not become pregnant the first time because reused her is my point. And so how many times have you been in a situation where people have misused you and abused you? Think of the emotions and all of the stuff, the turmoil that you went through, she must have went through. And to be rejected on top of that, that's a major wound. That is a major spiritual wound. And this is why we have deliverance. is so that those kind of things can be healed. Those kind of thorns can be... Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you how it works. See, what we did on the Wednesday night Bible study was a general deliverance. It was not an individual deliverance. An individual deliverance would get, in, get into reasons why the door was open in the first place. And when the door is open in the first place, you can see where the enemy has his hooks in you. See, information is power. Knowledge is power. And so if we can determine, as we determine where the original source of the injury came from, then we can heal it. Oh, bless the Lord. Now, I, I was just, I spent some time at the dentist here recently, and I had a tooth that, uh, I had a very poor dentist uh, back in the day, like many years. And this thing had plagued me for decades, decades, and Lord finally gave me correct dentist. And the, the gum was rotten underneath this cap. And it would cause me pain and I could only chew on the left side. But you can really crimp a brother's style when he's trying to eat some ribs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but when I went to this dentist, it was an interesting thing that she did. 
when she assessed me, she's the best dentist I've ever had. No, I'm not going to say her name and give her a free commercial. But, but what she did was she looked at my gum and she said, well, why didn't the other dentist fix this? I don't know. Didn't. I'd been to three before. She says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to cut out the gum that's rotten. And we're going to replace the cap and we're going to let the tooth grow back or the gum grow back naturally and you'll be able to chew on both sides. And she did it. Gum grew back. I'm chewing. I'm happy to be alive because I can chew some ribs and some chicken now. But what's my point for bringing that up? The point was she had to cut out the rotten part so that things could grow back naturally. And when they grow back naturally, it's healed and healthy and whole. And that's what delivers the rotten part so that your spirit man can grow back healthy and whole and chew food on both sides and not be crippled walking around trying to halfway minister and halfway live. Instead, you can be healed whole and delivered. Let me get on down the road here. Anyway, verse 6, it says, Behold, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as it pleases you. What an absolutely callous thing to say. That, that, this whole attitude that they have is very akin to Adam and Eve in the garden, in my opinion, where she influenced him yeah. to do something that was out of order. Yes. He agreed, so he acquiesced in his responsibilities. What he should have done as a man of God was say, no, honey, we're not going to do that. This is, God gave us a promise of a child, but I don't need to go make anything happen on my own. Mm -mm -mm -mm. See, we get in trouble when we try to make things happen. Impatient, don't want to wait on God. I'm going to help God out. Just in case he doesn't have enough power, let, him, let me loan him some of my power. <laughs> Amen. So she, when she dealt harshly with her, she fled from her face. What, what an interesting statement. That's a natural reaction. Someone hurts you, mistreats you. It is a natural thing for you to leave and say, that's it, I'm out of here. I'm done. No more for you, boo. Verse 7, things start to get interesting. It says that the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to shore. You know, when the Bible says things, we need to really pay attention to the wording of it. And that's one of the reasons why I love the King James, because, it, you know, to read this, you'd think it's just a novel. But it says, and the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water. Anytime you see water flowing, hello, the Holy Spirit's trying to talk to you. Found her by a fountain of water. See, believe it or not, there's anointing for you in the hard place. She's walking along in the wilderness in the hot, dry, arid place. In a place where it's dry. Nothing appears to be going Oh, and by the way, uh, she was on her way to Shur. And when you study out the word Shur, there's absolutely nothing about that name. There's no history, no wars fought, nothing of significance. It was just a place, probably a, a place where people just stopped on their path and traded along, trudged along, whatever. And so my point is, you can be in the middle of what appears to be nothing, wilderness, when you've been treated, mistreated, abused, reused, it doesn't matter where you are, God can find you exactly in the middle of where you think nothing is going on. He knows how to find you. Amen. Or can I put it like this? He knows how to locate you. Amen. He knows where you are. He knows where you are at 3.30 in the morning crying in your bed and no one's around. He knows where you are 
when you've been mistreated, whether it's on a job or in a relationship or, or someone did you wrong, stuck a knife in your back. He knows how to locate you and talk to you if you're receptive to hear him. Amen. It says right here, and the Lord found her, angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain on the way to shore. And the reason why this is so significant to me is because it wasn't said one time, but twice in the same sentence. Anytime you see something mentioned twice in a set of scriptures, pay attention because the Lord's doubling down on it. Because it says, found her by a fountain in the wilderness, by the fountain. He didn't stutter. There's a double something going on. Uh-oh. Can I tell you something? The Lord wants to bless you in the place where you don't even think you can be blessed. See, we're talking about God who sees you. It's not limited to your circumstance. He's not limited to your understanding. He's not limited to how your facts and figures are going to compute and add together. That's why it's good to know that one of the attributes of God is the, the God who is the creator. And he can create a solution to your problem. Amen. Then he asks her a very interesting question. He says, where do you come from? And where are you going? Now, the last time I checked, God knows everything. So why would he take the time to send the angel to ask her? Sometimes we need to take the time to consider all that we've been through. What are the circumstances? How severe were they? See, part of dealing with the rotten gum was having to get all up in my mouth and assess how rotten the gum really was. Sometimes you need to take the time to assess how rotten your situation really is. How have you really been mistreated? Where was it that it went wrong? Well, in my particular case, it turns out that the dentist back in the day didn't know what he was doing. And he put in the wrong kind of a uh, tooth or a dam or whatever you call it. And I had a violent reaction to it, but he didn't have enough knowledge and understanding to understand that it messed up my mouth. But God had to give me one, somebody that recognized that, that I had an allergic reaction. That's why the gum never healed. You need to assess of how you have been mistreated and abused. Hmm, that's painful. You mean I got to stop and think about how they did me wrong? How is it that I, I've got to spend the time, I'm just trying to run and get away from it. But you want me to stop and think about it. Because in the thinking of the full extent of it, now we can really get down to the, the full rottenness of it. And then we can also see the full glory of the Lord as he comes in to heal it and restore. Amen? Because he asked her, where are you going? And I want you to know that she says, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarah. Notice it didn't say, I'm going to a place. All she was doing was running from, but she didn't make a statement of where she was going to. And how many people do you know live their life running from situations, from memories, but are not going to where the Lord would have them to go? Stop to consider where is it that you're going. You need a vision from God, not your vision, but you need a vision from God where you are supposed to go. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he gets older, he will not depart. Amen? Amen. Well, I... These are just some nuggets along the way, but let's keep going. Verse 9, the angel said, Return unto your mistress and submit unto her hand. Wow. I know Pastor Kathy, uh, Prophetess Kathy, uh, ministered on this years ago or a long time ago. But when you are under a hard taskmaster, you have to face your fear. The victory is in facing your fear, not in fleeing from it. You have to assess the situation. That's why if you get a bill in the mail that's unexpected, you need to take it out and actually read it. 
rather than sticking it over in the drawer and say, I'm not going to deal with it. You need to read it because guess what? There might just be a loophole in that letter that the illumination of the Lord can give you like, oh, I, I didn't know that if I did this by this date, it might just go away. But if we operating in fear, we'll never see the loophole. He said, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hands. Wow. And I, I, I just want to say this. This is just, the Lord didn't speak this to me. This is just my observation here. I find it fascinating because any other time in the Bible when it says the angel of the Lord showed up, people cowered in fear. But it didn't happen here. You don't see any comment about her laying prostrate because she was afraid of the angel of the Lord. So clearly the angel of the Lord came in such a manner that was soothing and in treating and in helping and did not frighten her. The Lord knows how to deal with you in such a way that will not frighten you. Tell your neighbor, you need to let your guard down. When the angel of the Lord shows up, it's okay. Uh-oh. Can I let you know another little secret? Guess what uh, uh, one of the definitions of pastor is? Angel. When a pastor shows up, don't always have your guard up. We're here to help you, not destroy you. Oh, bless the Lord. Return to your mistress, submit yourself underneath her hand. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply your seed exceedingly, and it shall not be numbered for the multitude. Now, this is interesting. Somebody say, that's, that's, a, that's a serious prophetic word right there. I will multiply your seed exceedingly so that it shall not be numbered for the multitude. Hmm. Interesting. Am I not mistaken or isn't that the same promise that he gave Abram? And he gives it to the maid. Perhaps it's because she's carrying Abram's seed and the promise is attached to the seed. Y'all better know who you're hooking up with. Amen. So that the right thing is attached to the seed. I will multiply your seed exceedingly so that it shall not be numbered. The same promise that he gave to Abram, the same anointing that is on Abram fell upon her seed. The problem was the timing. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord says, Behold, you are with child. Stop, look, check it out. You're with the child. You shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael. For the Lord has heard thy affliction. And Ishmael's uh, name means God will hear. Interesting. Now, in this story, what we're looking at is the difference between grace and mercy. Grace was on Isaac's child, or Isaac the child, because he was the one called of the Lord. Mercy was on Ishmael because of Hagar and all that she went through. Let me back up and let me just say it like this. Verse 12, he goes on to say, He will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, as he shall dwell in the presence of his brothers. That sounds like a contrary spirit to me. Contrary. His hand's going to be against everybody. Everybody's going to be against him. That's a contrary spirit. So I want to say no unity. Antagonistic. So who is Ishmael? If we were to put it in today's society, who would Ishmael be? Many of the Arabic people. And my question is for you, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but many of them are against everybody, and everybody's against them, 
and they're against each other. So the, that thing is carried on from generation to generation. In fact, if my understanding is right, uh, because of the tribalistic mindset, they cannot seem to get into any kind of unity and agreement because they're so fiercely adept at keeping vengeance as their motivation. Which is interesting. I want you to think about this for a minute. We're talking about a child that was raised by Hagar that probably heard the stories of Hagar growing up. Heard that his mother believed God, the angel took care of her, gave her a prophetic word, but also the fact that Abram abandoned her. Are you hearing me? And so that anger, that revenge, seems to be in the generations because they seem to be a very angry people on a general rule. And one against another, one against another. Somebody say, you can get mad at me if you want. I'm just telling you what I, I've observed. So here's where it becomes interesting. Ishmael, meaning God will hear, that was God's mercy to visit her at the place of her affliction because she went through some stuff that was not right. And God decided to bless her. So wait a minute. Let me make sure. I, I think I can understand this. So what we just saw was God coming in to locate Hagar in the midst of all that she had been through, and he says, I'm going to bless you anyway. Because of the blessing was on Abram. I'm going to multiply your seed and compensate you for the wrong that has been done to you. Oh, I hope you understand this. See, there's nothing wasted in God. And when someone misuses misuses you, mistreats you, and abuses you, God knows how to come in, step in, and re recompense you. Hallelujah. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the law of exchange. <laughs> I hope you understand. Because she was mistreated, and God said, let me exchange all of that mistreatment for a blessing in your seed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, if what I'm telling you is so, it would seem that there would almost be other scriptures. Put a bookmark there. Thank you, Lord. We're just going to follow this. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to James. You thought I was stuck in the Old Testament, did you? James chapter 1. And this is why this is so important. Ah, James 1, verse 2. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. Even though she was in a hard place and in a hard way, she was running from, the Lord still found her and still found a way to bless her. Even though the man of God misused her and misused his authority, he knew how to bless her despite the stupid stuff. That's why you have the responsibility to forgive and count it as joy. Because when you count it as joy, it now becomes a seed that God can multiply and bless you with. Oh. Haven't we learned the principle of seed time and harvest? Haven't we learned that every act is a every deed is a seed? Haven't we learned the whole principle of tithing and offering? That's all about sowing seed. Don't we understand that? Uh, uh, that God will give seed to the sower. He'll give you something to sow even if you don't have seed. He'll put seed in your hand. Yeah. So why are you getting upset if you've gone through some stuff? 
because it's really seed if you understand. And if you learn to have a grateful heart and be humble Amen. and forgive, it goes right here, count it all joy. It was a trial and tribulation. It was a pain in your heart. But now it becomes seed because you now spiritually know how to treat it as such. It can now bless you instead. And how do you do that? You say, Lord, that's it. Oh, thank you, Lord. That's why we have to go and search the depth of that rotten gum so that you can give it all to him. Lord, don't you see how deep this thing cut me? Don't you see how rotten this situation is? But if you're too busy trying to shellack it over and run from it and just play it off, you're not giving the Lord anything to work with. But if you say, look at the depth of this thing. Look at the evil that was perpetrated against me. Look how they misused me, abused me. Even though they might have had authority over me, they mistreated me wrong, but Lord, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. And exchange that for your blessing. And when you understand this, you can now count it all joy. When you fall into a different Temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work. Yeah, it might take some time to work things out, but in the end, it's going to work out for your good. Amen. You know, the Lord woke me up at about 4 o'clock this morning. And I was debating, because this is a private word with my wife and I, but he blessed me. I'm going to share it with you. He spoke to me, Philippians 1, verse 19. Let's just go there. And this is kind of off topic, but not really. And I thought this was very interesting because this is, I'm going to kind of pull back and become a little bit transparent to you and, and just tell you that everything in ministry uh, is not about the mic and getting glory. A lot of people think that it's all about being seen and having power over the mic. But if you're really a servant of God, you're going to pay some price. If you want ministry, prepare to get offended. Somebody will offend you. That's why you have to walk in forgiveness so that you don't stem or cut off your anointing. Because if you're in unforgiveness, there will be no anointing. Here we go. Verse 19. Well, let me back up. I'll, I guess I'll read it to you and then I'll tell you what the Lord was dealing with me on. Um, verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ even out of envy or jealousy and strife, some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ out of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bounds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, was notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I do rejoice, yes, I will rejoice. Verse 19 is what he gave me. For I know that in this, this too shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit in Jesus Christ. And the reason why that that ministered to me, because back in the day, we have helped a great many people. But sometimes you had people that would betray you. That would stab you in the back. After you poured out your heart and did the best you could for them, they still mistreated you. Don't you know that that was a grievous wound? That was kind of like Hagar in the wilderness a little bit. Amen? Then, in addition to, or they go out and say, okay, thank you very much for the information. Now I'm going to go out and do my thing and just tear away and tear up the ministry and talk about you on the way out the door after you didn't help them. Bless the Lord. Don't feel bad for me because I'm healed. <laughs> I'm all right with it. But watch this. The Lord explains something because it says right here, whether they go out and do what they do through pretense, whether they're pretending to be all that in a bag of chips, 
whether they have the right spirit or not. Whatever it is, as long as they're preaching Jesus Christ, good. Watch this. Because I know, verse 19, that this shall turn to my salvation. Whatever they're doing, whether they have the right motive or they have the wrong motive, God still looks at it because we planted seed. And he knows how to separate their foolishness from our, fool, our, our walk of faith, doing the right thing by the right spirit. That's why you need to keep the right heart because when someone does something wrong to you, God knows how to separate their foolishness from your walk of faith. Amen. You just keep the right heart. And so in this, I know that it will turn to our salvation. Now, what does that mean? Through the, all the things that happened to us, we learned some lessons along the way, right? Amen. But, look at these words. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Last time I checked, he had an unlimited supply. Uh-oh. And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Or can I say it like this? And the anointing. So everything that they did, that's on them. But because we planted the seed... The Lord increases our anointing because it's out there. Now, how does that have to do with anything with Hagar? Hagar knows where you are. I mean, not Hagar. The Lord knows where you are. If you are experiencing the same situations as Hagar, where you've been mistreated, abused, reused, someone betrayed you, whatever the case may be, the Lord knows how to locate you. As long as you keep your heart right, before him, remember, she had to go back and submit. Wow. She had to go back, instead of running from the problem, she had to go back and submit to the, to the harsh lady. And in that faithfulness, she had to have the right heart. And God says, look what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to multiply your seed that it will be without number. And look, and look at the Middle East. You can't even count those folks over there. Amen? Amen? Let's go back to Genesis 16. But I have to say this. We have to take the time to say this here. Because Ishmael was birthed out of the flesh, it was not by the Spirit of God. This Amen. was Abram and Sarai's doing. They said, we're going to help out God. We're going to, because you're taking too long. You didn't do things in the way that we thought you should do it. We're just going to go ahead and help you out. Take Hagar the maid, hook you up, get you a baby, and call it a day. But the progeny, as a result of doing this from the flesh, was that he would be a wild man, a contrary spirit. Let me tell you something. Anytime you do something out of the flesh instead of by the Spirit, it'll always have the contrary spirit. It'll always be opposite. It will not jive with the things of God. It will not agree with the Word. There's enmity in the Spirit between flesh and Spirit. Amen? Amen. Now watch this. And, thank you, Lord. If you have created works of the flesh... I'm not talking about children, so don't get nervous. But if you have done things that are out of order, out of timing of God, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Ask for his forgiveness, admit it, quit it, and move on. Because guilt and shame is of the enemy. God says, okay, we made the mistake. Let's get it together now. Time to get on down the road. Amen? Amen? Ishmael represents the counterfeit project. Anything that people do to try to help God out, it represents the counterfeit move of God. There's many counterfeit 
moves of God out there. There are many counterfeit projects. There are many counterfeit churches. You could almost say it's like the spirit of substitution. Because Ishmael was to be a substitute for Isaac, which was the real promise. And to this day, we see a whole bunch of stuff that is attempting to substitute the Abrahamic faith for Islamic faith. I'm just going to say it like it is. In fact, Ishmael is worshipped as a prophet in the Islamic religions, Muslim religions. But he's not a prophet. He's simply a child. Okay. Verse 13. And she called the name of the Lord and says, You, God, see me. Have I also here looked after him that sees me? And the well was called Beer Loha Aroi, which means the well of the God who sees me. And earlier I mentioned that the fountain of the water, which was mentioned twice, you need to understand that God will double down on on his exchange of the blessing for your whatever shame you have gone through, he's going to double down the blessing to compensate you. God is not one that's going to let uh, uh, treat it. If you've been mistreated, he knows how to recompense you, and he'll double down on it. Two times the well was mentioned. Well, three times in the whole uh, chapter. But here it is called the well uh, where God sees me. Now here is interesting because it says it was between Kadesh and Bered. And the name Kadesh literally means sanctuary. Sanctuary. Interesting. What does Bered mean? It means hail. H-A-I-L. Hail. Now, if you're in Texas not too long ago, we had a major hailstorm. And in our neighborhood, we saw all kinds of houses being, they were patching up their roofs and the whole nine yards because of the hail that came down and tore it up. So what is hail? Hail represents the random rocks from the sky. So in other words, you can get hit by stuff that's just random. It doesn't mean that it was a demonic assignment. It just meant that you got hit. And sometimes it hurts and it causes damage. But guess what? If you're in between the place of sanctuary, you know where you're supposed to get to, where it's safe, and you're still caught up in a lot of stupid stuff. I can still find you. For he is the God who sees you. He knows how to locate you and to come talk to you and come bless you in the midst of it. And if you're wise, you will not get offended about it, but you will count it all as joy. And understand that you have seed that is now placed in your hand, that now you can expect God to bless you, double down on the blessing, and cause you to prosper and multiply, even in the midst of all the stupid stuff. I'm trying to help somebody today. Tell your neighbor, be wise. Don't get offended. Oh, there's plenty of reasons to get offended. Plenty of reasons. They know how to mess you over. They know how to stab you in the back. They know how to abuse you, reuse you, and misuse you. But God knows how to compensate you. He knows how to set it right. You just keep your heart right. You just stay faithful. You go back and to submit to whatever God is telling you to submit to. Oh, so that means in order to do that, I have to have a humble spirit. So I can't do it out of pride. Go back to the lady that was mistreating me like, yeah. Not going to work. You have to go back and humble yourself. So I don't know who that's for, but somebody here needs to go back and humble themselves in a situation that they just came out of. That's by the Spirit of the Lord. You might have to apologize. Even though they were wrong, you might have been wrong. They might have been wrong. Everybody was wrong. (laughs) But you 
still need to sometimes just humble yourself because it's about the obedience to the Lord that gives him permission to act on your behalf. And as doing so, notice that the blessing came after the command to go back and humble herself. Amen. Amen. You believe in God for a breakthrough? I'm telling you, you want to make sure you don't have any offense in your heart. In, thank you, Lord. Now, on the prayer, I called out unforgiveness, but I need to make something perfectly clear. Unforgiveness is not a spirit. Uh, Unforgiveness is a decision. You have to decide to forgive. I can't cast it out of you. I can't step over your free will. God doesn't step over our free will. So I can't step over your free will and cast some spirit of unforgiveness out. But I called it out because that needed to be dealt with. But you have to decide, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to release them. And if you're wise, as I said before, you will take that as seed and say, I'm giving it all to you, God. Exchange it for my benefit. Exchange it for the promises that you promised me. Walk in my blessing, and I'm going to go ahead and receive the multiplication of the promises that you promised. I urge you today. God is not such a hard God that he doesn't understand all that you have been through. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross as a man, not as God. Because he had to understand everything that we would go through in our frail frames. He took off his divinity and was wrapped in flesh and went through all of our trials and tribulations just like we have. He understands and he sees. Not one iota have you gone through that he's not seen. Amen? Praise God. I encourage you this day. Can we just stand on our feet? Amen. I pray that that day, and I pray that you will have the wisdom to take every single act of mistreatment against you and to give it to God and exchange it. Let's repeat after me. Father, this day, in the name of Jesus. Everything that has been done to me that was wrong, I purpose in my heart that I will not carry it anymore. But I give it to you, Lord. And I refuse to carry it anymore in Jesus' mighty name. I exchange it. Now, Lord, I ask, bless me. In Jesus' name, amen. Won't you welcome Pastor Paul. This has been a weekly sermon from Due Season Christian Church International. For more information about Due Season and other resources, visit us on the web at dueseason.org.